The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Improving Outcomes and Preventing Chronic Kidney Disease Progression. Evaluating the role of novel non-steroidal mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash CWT 860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Thank you for listening to Peerview Podcasts. We greatly appreciate your support and would like to hear from you. Can we ask for a favor? Participate today in a short one-minute survey at www.peerview.com forward slash podcast survey to share how podcasts play a role in your medical education routine. Again, that's www.peerview.com forward slash podcast survey to participate. And now on to today's podcast. Hello, I'm Dr. George Backris from the University of Chicago Medicine. Welcome to this educational activity on chronic kidney disease. Joining me today is Dr. Rajiv Agarwal from Indiana University School of Medicine. Together, we plan to discuss some of the current guidelines pertaining to screening and treatment of patients with chronic kidney disease, including current and recent advances with mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists. I want to start off by actually giving you a little bit of background in terms of end-stage kidney disease and kidney disease around the world. It is clear that the prevalence of end-stage kidney disease has dramatically increased from 2000 to 2015 and even more so today as you'll see in a second. But if you look at this map, it's very clear that the darker the color, the greater the prevalence and definitely things are going in the wrong direction. If you actually look then at kidney disease, cardiovascular disease, and type 2 diabetes as interrelated disorders, it's very clear that there's a major overlap and approximately 35%, if you take a middle number, have diabetes and kidney disease. And then even higher percentage of patients with heart failure, diabetes, and kidney disease. So there's no question about it. This is not just a kidney problem. This is a problem that relates to organs. Remember, the heart and the kidney are married. They're a married couple, and if one isn't doing well, the other one isn't doing well. Remember that concept. So what's good for the kidney is good for the heart and vice versa. Now, what can you do <clears throat> to monitor CKD progression. And this is very simple, very simple. This has been reported over 30 years ago. Nobody seems to pay attention or doesn't want to believe it. It's very simple. Get the blood pressure controlled to less than 130. Get the glucose controlled to a hemoglobin A1C of less than 7. And importantly, control the lipids and get the LDL into double digits. This is especially true all the way down to a GFR 45. When you go below that, lipids are not as important, but glucose and blood pressure are. So it's very, very important. The other thing is, you properly have to stage kidney disease. You can't just measure eGFR. You have to measure albuminuria. You have to. A spot urine is all you need. And in the beginning, when kidney function's good, you only have to do it once a year, but you need that to really properly stage people. And this is an example of data that I was telling you that's relatively old, but long-term follow-up. There's actually a 21-year follow-up of the study now. And you can see what it took for so-called intensive therapy, even higher than some of the guideline recommendations today, and still a benefit was seen. Now, it's critically important. I can't overemphasize this. Critically important to tell the patient they have kidney disease, period. This data here shows that almost half the patients with severely reduced kidney function, these are GFRs down in the 30s, who were totally unaware, totally unaware that they had kidney disease. The patient's adherence is critical. If the patient knows they have kidney disease and they know that if they do the things you just told them, per what we discussed, they will follow it much more carefully if they know there's a threat that they will lose their kidney function. 
very, very important. This is from the National Kidney Foundation and the KDGO, the International Guidelines of Kidney Disease, the so-called heat map. And this is why, if you look at this carefully, GFR is on the left, albuminuria is on the top. That's why you have to measure both. And show the patient this. Very important. They'll see if they're in the red. You don't have to say anything. They know they got a big problem. Very, very important. Very simple. Takes two seconds. Now, that's the background. And with that background, I want to bring Dr. Rajiv Agarwal in to give us some important strategies on managing patients. Uh, thank you, George. Uh, that was uh, an excellent introduction because, as you said, uh, the kidney and the heart are a married couple. And if one is sick, the other person is not doing well. Uh, this is one of the landmark studies. This was published in New England Journal of Medicine in 2004. And what it showed was that the kidney disease uh, was associated very strongly with all-cause mortality and with cardiovascular events. What you see on this graph is that as the kidney uh, disease progresses, uh, people with less than 15 EGFR, for example, have the highest risk for death and the highest risk of cardiovascular events. And as you pointed out, this starts happening at about an EGFR of 45. So if you have uh, that inflection point of 45, that's where it starts happening. So Rajiv, let me ask you something. And there's a lot of discussion now in the cardiovascular community that advanced kidney disease, GFR below 45, is actually a risk factor, not a risk marker, but a risk factor for cardiovascular death. And there's a lot of data mechanistically that is evolving for that. What are your thoughts about that? So, you know, I think that uh, we knew this all along, uh, that uh, kidney disease is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. We have known it from the times of Sir Richard Bright, you know, where he shows that uh, sick kidneys associate with sick hearts. Uh, then it was the Framingham Heart Study that showed association of dipstick proteinuria with left ventricular hypertrophy and cardiovascular events. It wasn't until we had 2004 a study published by Alan Go that, uh, that the community uh, woke up and say, oh, this is happening. But we have known it for a long time. I think, as you said, that you know, albuminuria is something that we are not measuring, and that's something that is critical for our friends to start doing. And I want to point out to the listenership that Alan Go is a cardiologist, not a nephrologist. So I think it's important to understand that background. The other point is we should not allow, if we can, and we can make a difference, we should not allow kidney disease to progress that far before we jump in. We should be doing something, even at GFRs of 60 and 70, with the, the risk factor modulation that we've already talked about, blood pressure, glucose, lipids. I mean, you agree, disagree? Uh, totally. I think that you know what is good for the heart is good for the kidney in general. So let's talk about the pathophysiology of chronic kidney disease. So we injure the kidney, and the ki uh, kidney has four compartments, the vasculature, uh, the glomerulus, the tubule, and the interstitium. And any of those four compartments, when injured, will lead to chronic kidney disease progression. So there's no really chronic kidney disease. It's chronic kidney diseases. You know, there's not one etiology, as you can see. It can be various etiologies. And when you injure the vasculature, it leads to arterial sclerosis, glomerulus, glomerulus sclerosis, tubules, tubular atrophy, and interstitium, interstitial fibrosis. So when this happens, then you're marching towards end-stage kidney disease. So the goals of CKD management is to prevent the progression of chronic kidney disease uh, to dialysis. That's the most feared complication of kidney disease. But also, most people will die of cardiovascular disease than end-stage kidney failure. So we have to minimize complications, and we have to promote quality of life in these patients. So the interventions uh, have to start early. They are kidney-friendly foods, low-salt diet, fresh fruits, vegetables, less processed foods. They are good for the kidneys. What is good for the heart is good for the kidneys. Maintaining a healthy body weight, controlling blood pressure and glucose levels. Again, these are 
the usual lifestyle modification advice that we give all patients with kidney disease. Now we have many trials. We have had drugs that have been used uh, starting from renal and IDNT, but lots of these drugs failed. For example, uh, we had endothelin receptor antagonist, avocentan, um, atrocentan. We had sulodexide. Number of trials we have been trying for the last 20 years, and we kept on failing and failing. So uh, let's talk about a case now. George, would you like to uh, walk us through the case now? So Rajiv, we have a 68-year-old man, long-standing coronary disease, type 2 diabetes, hypertension for 22 years, hyperlipidemia for 15, and kidney disease for 7, diabetes for 10, with 1 plus beta edema, and he's coming in with a blood pressure of 138 over 76, and he's got a creatinine of 1.6, and he's got 494 milligrams of albumin. And his medications are there. You can see them. Lisinopril, hydrochlorothiazide combo, 10, 20, 12 and a half, and metoprolol, 100. He's being treated for diabetes, and he's being treated for lipids. What do you think of that blood pressure medic regime? Well, uh, George, clearly this blood pressure is high. Uh, 138 over 76 is above our guidelines of 130. We need to get the blood pressure down. Before we get the blood pressure down, we have to be sure that the blood pressure that we are measuring is the way in which it should be measured, which is after seated rest for five minutes um, and triplicate measurement uh, appropriate uh, technique. If we do all that and we still find that the blood pressure is elevated, we need to get it down. Several things we can do, for example, in this patient, uh, we can add a fourth drug, he's already on three drugs, so clearly has resistant hypertension. The fourth drug, uh, in this case, I would probably pick amlodipine uh, in this situation uh, because I'm worried about using spironolactone in this patient because a uh, patient has a potassium of uh, 4.5 and GFR of 45, right at the threshold where the European Society of Cardiology says that we should not be using spironolactone. So I would uh, use that regimen to get the blood pressure down, besides advising the patient to be on a low-sodium diet. So let me, um, let me challenge you. This is a guy with 494 milligrams of albumin in his urine. He's got a GFR of 45, and he is not, per the resistant hypertension guidelines, on maximally tolerated lisinopril. He's certainly on an inappropriate diuretic. So you wouldn't change that? Great question, and you know, I think that uh, a snapshot may not reveal what was going on. Uh, in fact, the patient might have been on a higher dose of lisinopril and got hyperkalemic, and that's why the physician chose to give low-dose lisinopril hydrochlorothiazide combo to get the potassium down, perhaps. But you know, assuming that's not the case, I absolutely agree with you that you know, 40 milligrams of lisinopril would be the guideline recommended therapy for treating the albuminuria. And uh, lisinopril in people with kidney disease uh, with a GFR of 45, once a day drug, but if your GFR is uh, close to normal, then it's a twice a day drug. Last point here, he's got coronary disease and the data with the toprolol is very good. Um, what would you think about switching it out and giving him diltiazem at a higher dose? There's some data with that, not as strong as metoprolol. That would give him additive antiproteinuric effects. Yes, I think that would be the added advantage of using uh, diltiazem. If he, if he used diltiazem, we can have additional antiproteinuric effects. You have shown, shown that, some other studies have shown that. The downside of that is that uh, it can interact with the torvastatin. You know, deltazem is a uh, cytochrome inhibitor and uh, atorvastatin levels may go up and puts the patient at risk for rhabdomyolysis. And this risk is particularly magnified in people who have kidney failure. So I would worry a little bit about that. Um, and I'm happy with the metoprolol because it's causing cardiac protection. And perhaps that's more um, relevant than just giving an antiproteinuric drug.
But because this patient's BMI is high, uh, some diabetologists may say that you know needs to be on certain newer anti-diabetics that can associate with uh, weight loss and reduction in appetite. And you know uh, we can even think about a guideline recommended therapy of the SGLT2 inhibitor in this case. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, let's move on and talk about MRAs and kind of a historical perspective. Thank you, Rajiv. Okay, so you know we are going to talk about MRAs, the myelocorticoid receptor antagonists, and these have been um, you know studied since 1938, and we had numerous people associated who, who are the who's who of medicine, uh, Grant Little, uh, George Thorne. These were uh, the historical figures who studied um, uh, mineralocorticoids and subsequently uh, found that if you block mineralocorticoid receptors, you can uh, derive benefits to the blood pressure. We then had the RALS trial that showed uh, protection for lives in people who had heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and that progressed to numerous other trials to the discovery of the non-steroidal MRAs that we will talk about uh, next. So our three ways that we have protected the heart and the kidney is to address blood pressure both at the level of the circulation and in the glomerulus, are to control glycemia and have metabolic effects through the control of diabetes. And now we're discovering that inflammation and fibrosis may be key factors. It's not to say that ACE and ARBs or SGLT2 inhibitors may not have some effect on inflammation and fibrosis, but what we are discovering now is that the mineralocorticoid receptor activation is central to the role of inflammation and fibrosis both in the heart and in the kidneys. And when we block that receptor using a non molecule such as phenernone, it can abrogate inflammation and fibrosis. So you might think that while well, spironolactone and eplornone might do it too, and, and they do, but we compare head to head in animals, we find that the non MRAs can actually abrogate inflammation and fibrosis much, much more so than the other steroidal MRAs like uh, spironolactone and eplernone. So a new drug application has recently been submitted to the FDA uh, as a marketing authorization application to the EMA for uh, getting approval for phenernone for uh, protecting the heart and the kidneys in people with type 2 diabetes and chronic kidney disease. This was based on the uh, trial that we discussed shortly but before we designed the phase three trial, we did a phase two trial. It was called the ARTS-DN. ARTS-DN was uh, about 800 patients, and they had escalating doses of phenernone all the way from placebo, zero milligrams, 2.5, 5, all the way to 20 milligrams once a day. And the primary endpoint there was to look at reduction in albuminuria from baseline to 12 weeks. And we did find improvement in albuminuria, about 30 to 40 percent. What we found was also there was not much of a signal for hyperkalemia. And this led us to hypothesize that MR antagonism with phenernone, which is a non steroidal MRA, can slow kidney disease progression and reduce CV morbidity and mortality in patients with advanced CKD and type 2 diabetes. Let us discuss the benefits and limitations of the conventional MRAs and CKD. Uh, there are two steroidal MRAs, eplernone and spironolactone. These are called steroidal because they have the steroidal structure, which is a cyclopentanoperhydrophenanthrocene ring, uh, the cholesterol nucleus that constitutes the molecule. Phenernone is non-steroidal because it's got a dihydropyridine structure. It uh, doesn't resemble these drugs. Uh, the result of this chemistry is that the phenernone is highly selective for the mineralocorticoid receptor. Uh, spironolactone is low selectivity, and when your selectivity is low, more prone to causing gynecomastia and sexual side effects. Eplernone is medium. Potency is another factor. For example, we know that uh, spironolactone can bind with high affinity to the receptor, and therefore 
Uh, it can have potent anti monocorticoid receptor effects. Uh, phenernone shares that property. However, uh, the effect of phenernone on blood pressure reduction is minimal compared to spironolactone. And this is in part because spironolactone has metabolites that are active. For example, candrenone and 7-alpha thiomethyl spironolactone, which are very long acting. 7-alpha uh, TMS has a half-life of almost a week. And when they accumulate, they can have profound blood pressure lowering. Uh, there are no active metabolites known for eplernone or phenernone. Therefore, they don't have as much blood pressure reduction as seen with spironolactone. Tissue distribution is important. The uh, spironolactone kidney is concentrated six times as much as the heart, eplernone three times as much as the heart, and phenernone, the heart and kidney are equal in concentration. Why this is important is because the kidney distribution can affect the hyperkalemic uh, potential. In fact, we look at randomized trials that have compared head-to-head -head spironolactone with uh, phenernone, which is the ARTS uh, program. We found that spironolactone was much more likely to cause hyperkalemia compared to phenernone. So I'm going to pick up now and move into the Fidelio trial and show you the design and the results. This is the largest renal outcome trial ever done to date. 5,734 patients were randomized, depending on their GFR, above or below 45, to either 10 or 20 milligrams of phenernone or placebo. Median follow-up of 2.6 years. And the primary endpoint was kidney failure, dialysis, um, renal death, or a greater than 40% decrease in GFR compared to the placebo group. There was also a pre-specified secondary endpoint, and the pre-specified secondary endpoint was cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke, or hospitalization for heart failure. And then there was a hierarchical analysis that then looked at all-cause mortality, hospitalization, change in UACR, and other factors, and we'll get into that. This is the primary endpoint, which was wildly significant, favoring an 18% risk reduction with phenerinone versus placebo. And remember, placebo was maximally tolerated ACER-ARB in 99 plus percent of the patients in the trial. So this is truly maximal therapy, plus statins, plus everything else. So you can still do better adding phenerinone versus placebo. And you can see the p-value there of 0.0014. If you look at the cardiovascular pre-specified effect, you can see here it's also wildly positive with a 14% risk reduction for cardiovascular events. And again, p-value of 0.0339. So definitely positive. If you look at the hierarchical analysis, meaning we go down, primary kidney endpoint, significant secondary CV endpoint, pre-specified, significant. And then all-cause mortality trend is positive, but not enough events, so didn't make significant. So unfortunately, everything after that, even if it looks significant, we can't really discuss it statistically, but you can see the data for yourself, certainly from kidney standpoints, very positive. Now, adverse events. Well, as you would expect, the major adverse event related to potassium. But I think it's important for us to discuss this because this is the only trial where maximizing RAS blockade, especially with an MRA, did not lead to early stopping of the trial or a large number of people permanently discontinuing. In fact, only 2.3% of the phenerinone group permanently discontinued and 0.9% of the placebo group. Now, how does this compare to other trials? And I think this is important. There are two other trials that were very similar populations, type 2 diabetes, advanced kidney disease, that looked at maximizing RAS inhibition, VA-nephron-D, and altitude. In both these trials, they were stopped early for lack of efficacy and safety issues. And you can see in purple the hyperkalemia rate 
in these trials. And you can see that the Fidelio trial pales by comparison in terms of hyperkalemia rates, and it was not stopped early for any issue. Now, you see the AMBER trial. What is the AMBER trial? The AMBER trial was conducted by Dr. Agarwal and others, and this trial was an interesting trial. This was not a kidney disease trial per se. It had people with advanced kidney disease similar to the other three studies, but this was a study to control resistant hypertension. So everybody, per guidelines, got spironolactone. And the question was, can we maintain the spironolactone if we give a potassium binder? And here, pteromir was a potassium binder, randomized. What you see there in 23% was the hyperkalemia rate in the group that got placebo instead of the binder. So you can see that adding spironolactone to an ACE or an ARB wildly increases it tenfold higher than what you saw with phenarinone. So in a similar population. So I think it's important to keep in mind that phenarinone is not your mother's spironolactone. So what are the takeaway messages? Well, the takeaway messages from this trial are number one, phenarinone reduced risk of kidney failure or sustained decrease in EGFR. There was a 3.4% absolute difference after three years between the placebo and the phenarinone group and you had to treat 29 patients to prevent dialysis or reduction in GFR. As far as cardiovascular events go, and we went through those, CV death, non-fatal MI, stroke or hospitalization for heart failure, there was a 2.4% absolute difference. After three years, uh, you had to treat 42 people to get the benefit on cardiovascular events. There was early reduction in albuminuria, that was sustained. That is critical because it was totally independent of blood pressure. This was not a hemodynamic effect. And so it gets back to what Dr. Agarwal was saying earlier about inflammation and other mechanisms. Glucose was certainly not affected. So lastly, there was no unexpected adverse events. And the hyperkalemia that was noticed with phenarinone is nowhere near that of what you see with these traditional steroidal agents. And again, it was not a reason to stop the trial. So given the case we already discussed, um, there was no SGLT2 used. Um, it's, it's certainly in the guidelines. Would you give this guy, even with the changes that we made, would you give this guy an SGLT2 inhibitor? Georgia, as you pointed out, the guidelines are pretty clear on it. The patient has a GFR of 45, uh, has a, um, albuminuria in the macroalbuminuria range, and all the guidelines will tell us that this patient will have benefit for his kidneys and his heart if he use an SGLT2 inhibitor. So there's no question in my mind that I would uh, place this patient on an SGLT2 inhibitor. Uh, I think it's a good thing. The only place where you won't uh, perhaps do it is if uh, the patient had a history of diabetic ketoacidosis. And if some patients tell me, after I tell them that there's a small risk of uh, genital fungal infections, they just refuse to take the drug. So sometimes people refuse also. But you know, if you tell them the risk and they're happy to take it, uh, I would uh, take it. If I were the patient or if I was treating a family member, I'd certainly use an SGLT2 inhibitor. There's no question. I agree with you. Okay. So we put him on an SGLT2. We got his blood pressure controlled. We made the changes. He's coming back now. His pressure is less than 130. So he's a goal. His glucose is better. Um, but you repeat the albumin. And he's, he's come down from about 500, but he's still at 300. Now what would you do? I think, uh, uh, George, at this point, phenarinone is a great option. This patient has a, still a residual albuminuria. If I use phenarinone uh, in this patient 10 milligrams once a day, uh, he has an 18% relative risk reduction in 
uh, kidney endpoint, 14% relative risk reduction in cardiac endpoint, and that's an amazing risk reduction. No question about uh, using phenernone in this patient once it's available. So there are many clinicians that you mentioned mineralocorticoids, and the next thing out of their mouth is hyperkalemia, not doing it. What's different about phenerinone and how would you monitor it? Because as I said, it's not your mother's spironolactone. Yes, so this patient has a potassium that is quite reasonable. Um, you know, in the uh, Fidelio trial, we did not expose people who had a, a potassium of 4.9 or more to uh, f uh, phenerinone uh, at the start. This patient has less. So this patient certainly would qualify even participating in the Fidelio trial. We call patients back after one month. And if you look at the trajectory of change of hyperkalemia, for instance, it's not happening, it's not concentrated right uh, at the beginning. It's sort of evenly distributed throughout the three years of the trial. So I think that patient requires potassium monitoring call him back in one month and then four months subsequently, and then uh, just treat uh, the potassium and the patient, and just like you would manage uh, an ACE or an ARB. I don't think that there's any uh, magic about it, but we have to be cognizant that uh, we have to monitor potassium. This is not a fire and forget uh, drug. It's not like a statin, you use a drug and okay, come back in a year. This will require some monitoring and if we are careful, I think we can save lives and we can save kidneys. So Dr. Agarwal, it's easy for you to say as a nephrologist and easy for me to accept as a nephrologist, but for our primary care audience, you really want to wait a month? Don't you want to check it in a week? Because I'm a little nervous. Well, you know, according to what we did in this uh, trial, we called them in a month. The question is how many people were discovered hyperkalemic at one month when they were not hyperkalemic. And you would have to screen 100 people before you will find one patient who gets hyperkalemia. This is not your drug that will raise potassium dramatically. The mean change in potassium that we saw was 0.23 millimoles at four months. This is not a hugely hyperkalemic drug. Yes, you can call them in a week, but you'll be calling a lot of patients with null results. This is not something like spironolactone. I, I thank you again. Want to make the point? This is not your mother's spironolactone. Okay, Rajiv, I'm going to give you a different scenario, similar case but different scenario that we just discussed. African American male, uh, past medical history, 22 years of hypertension, hyperlipidemia for 15 years. Um, he's got coronary disease. Two stints were placed 14 years ago. He's got type 2 diabetes for 10 years. He's got CKD for seven. And he's got one plus fetal edema. Now, he's on a medication regimen that um, is similar to what we had. And you optimize this therapy by starting him on deltiazem and olmosartan and chlorothaladone, taper the metoprolol, and stop lisinopril and hydrochlorothiazide. He comes in, and two weeks later, He's got a blood pressure of 168 over 70. He's still got the S4, uh, but he's got no JVD and his heart rate 64. What would you do then? That's a great question, uh, George, because this patient, you have optimized his therapy. You went to all Sartan and the newer drugs and his blood pressure is high. The first thing I will ask is, did he fill his drugs? A lot of these patients will go out. They will read on the internet the uh, stuff on the medications, they'll never take it, or they might have a problem with insurance not uh, filling it, or they might simply uh, not take the medication. So first thing is adherence. The second is the uh, patient has a high BMI, perhaps uh, people uh, who are diabetologists might need to use some other um, anti-diabetic drugs that will cause weight loss also, and that might actually improve his BMI and glycemic control. Uh, 168 is terrible blood pressure. And if it's happening despite uh, increasing the therapy, I think the first thing I would uh, focus on is adherence. 
And as you know, if we do uh, random drug testing on these people, that means uh, test for not drugs of abuse, but drugs uh, that they are supposed to be taking, oftentimes we will find none. So I think that would be a very important part of the uh, therapy. So that's a very important point. Uh, just for the listener, why was diltiazem chosen and not amlodipine? Because diltiazem has been shown in multiple studies to have additive antiproteinuric effects and at higher doses, good blood pressure lowering effects, albeit 300 is a medium dose. Um, so, I mean, from my standpoint, what we could do here is actually increase the diltiazem to 360 and he needs a fourth drug now. Is he on an SGLT2? Doesn't look like it. Uh, let's assume, let's assume for the sake of argument that he is taking the drugs. We can add an SGLT2, that'll help his blood pressure a little bit, but he's gonna need more. He's gonna need more. So what would you add here? Would you give him Spiro? Let's say his potassium is 4.3. I mean, that would be the recommendation. He's got 600 milligrams of albumin here. Would you give him spironolactone here? So, you know, according to the European Society of Cardiology, they say that if you have a EGFR of less than 45 and K more than 4.5, you shouldn't be using it. Because he has an EGFR of 30, uh, he technically wouldn't qualify. A plenone says in this package insert, microalbuminuria is a contraindication to using uh, the drug. And clearly EGFR of 30 would be a contraindication for eplernone as well. So yes, those drugs would be contraindicated. I think phenernone would be a good choice. I think that in this patient, because you increase diltiazem uh, and he comes with uh, muscle pain next time, I would check a CK because you know diltiazem can inhibit the metabolism of uh, atorvastatin. And sometimes you can get uh, rhabdomyolysis if you have uh, super high levels of these drugs. So those are the two caveats I would have in this. Okay. Now, what we already said, if you give phenarinone, that would definitely help the proteinuria, but it's not gonna help the blood pressure. So we need something for the blood pressure. So what would you do? Would you add hydralazine? Would you, add, if you can't use the mineralocorticoids, what would you do to get the pressure down? Hydralazine is absolutely a lousy drug in my opinion. Um, you know, uh, a drug that has to be taken three times a day to control blood pressure is a non-starter. I hardly ever use it for uh, blood pressure control in these individuals. He's on chlorothalidone, 25 milligrams a day. Uh, there's room there, we can go to 50 milligrams and that might help the potassium as well because phenernone might get you a slight increase in potassium and increase in chlorothalidone might actually allow the use of uh, phenernone better and get the blood pressure down. So thank you for saying that about hydralazine. I fully agree with you. Um, it turns out, full disclosure, this patient was not taking his medications. And so when he went on his medications, we didn't need to make all those adjustments because he actually did far better. So I think that's an important point, and I just want to reinforce that. And by the way, patients will say, are you say, are you taking your drugs? They'll say yes. It turns out they're only taking one, but they're taking their drugs. So I think it's important to keep that perspective when you're talking to patients. So I'm going to conclude by basically saying that type 2 diabetes, chronic kidney disease, and heart failure are interrelated conditions with growing prevalence and strategies for these conditions. They're limited. MRAs can definitely interrupt the binding of aldosterone to its receptor, thus preventing inflammation and fibrosis and CKD. And phenarinone, the non-steroidal, non-spiro uh, type MRA, offers high efficiency, high efficacy, low rates of adverse events compared to the steroidal MRAs in diabetic kidney disease. And yes, in the beginning, you do have to monitor for hyperkalemia. This ends our discussion for today. Rajiv and I hope that you found today's presentation useful. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash CWT860. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Bayer Healthcare Pharmaceuticals Incorporated. This activity has been jointly provided by Medical Learning Institute Incorporated.
and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education.